Hey guys, Jordan here. I'm just gonna be doing some abstract art, listening to some copyright free chill hop music, listening to lecture four from less for lessons for better communication. How to navigate face threatening acts. How to navigate face threatening acts. Sometimes we as speakers have to navigate very tricky social and conversational territory. We've all been there. For example, I need to ask you a favor, and I know that it is asking for a lot. Or, I need to tell you something that I am pretty sure you do not want to hear. In these situations, you may find yourself thinking, I am dreading this. How am I going to say this right? How do I make this conversation go well? Now, why are some of these conversations so poor? There are a couple of reasons. There's a feeling that we're imposing in some way. Imposing on someone's time, imposing on someone's sense of well-being. Second, we have the sense that feelings might get hurt, or a relationship might get damaged, or if not damaged, at least dinged. In this lecture, we will talk about strategies for navigating this sometimes fraught territory, for making people feel better about being imposed upon, or hearing hard truths. Linguists have a useful way of talking about what we're negotiating here. We talk about face. This is to some extent the same kind of face that we're talking about when we use the expression saving face. If I'm trying to save face, I'm trying to save my reputation or my dignity and also my likability. And sometimes, as speakers, we have to do things that threaten other people's face. Now, this is where politeness comes in. Politeness is one of the most fundamental guiding principles in any society, let alone a conversation. Yet we rarely step back to think through politeness in much detail. We can think of it as words like please and thank you and other more perfunctory bits of language. But in fact, Politeness is a much bigger set of principles for navigating social relationships. It's the way that we show respect for other people and we find ways to get what we need from others. We know that often we need to do more than say please and thank you. And in this lecture, we'll talk through some of the more global strategies central to politeness and how you can enact these strategies in daily conversation. So what exactly does it mean to be polite? Being polite is acting in such a way that you are taking into account other people's feelings and desires. In other words, you're trying to respect what other people need and want. You're also respecting cultural expectations for what is acceptable behavior. When you think about it, Politeness is what allows us to live together in communities, to show the respect we need to show in order to live together peacefully and amiably. We need to show respect for what other people need and want. There are real cultural differences in politeness, and it's important to figure those out when you step into another culture. Sometimes these are smaller linguistic differences, and let me give you two examples. For instance, in the U.S., the answer to how you are is typically that you're fine or you're good. That's the generic answer. But author Isabel Allende reminds us that in Chile, the right answer is so-so, because you wouldn't want to seem better than the person who asked you the question. As a second example, in the U.S., if someone comes over for dinner and brings a gift, say a bottle of wine or some chocolate, it's typical that they will hand the gift to the host, and the host will accept the gift and say thank you. When I lived in China, though, I learned that it was polite to leave the gift on a table as you came in the door and not say anything about it. That way, the host did not have to acknowledge the gift and thank you at that very moment, which could potentially be embarrassing to both of you in terms of the debt incurred. Then 
sometimes there are bigger differences in terms of politeness. For example, in some cultures, politeness involves more camaraderie, and in others, it involves more aloofness. These are different ways of showing respect for other people. Now, in all of these examples, I'm hinting at face. So let's define that. Our face is our public self-image, as well as the social space that we claim. Let me explain what I mean by that. Linguists talk about positive face and negative face. I'm going to reframe that as positive face and personal space. Positive face refers to the general desire that each of us has to have other people like us and respect us. In general, we all want people to approve of what we do, to think that we are admirable, nice people, to appreciate who we are and what we do. This is a very human desire to be liked. Now, sometimes I'll say that and people will say, no, no, I know someone who really doesn't care what other people think. My reaction is that this person is actually probably quite invested in the public image that they don't care what others think. In other words, they want us to admire in them the disposition that allows them to act like they don't care what we think. Negative face is what I will refer to as personal space. It refers to each of our desire to have the space to make the choices we want and in general to do what we want to do. In general, we want to be able to make our own choices. And we don't really want to be imposed upon in ways that we can't do what it is that we want to do. Now, as soon as I say that, you're probably thinking, but people impose on my personal space all the time. Really, anytime anybody asks me to do something, they're imposing on my space. And that is exactly right, which is why we are generally polite when we ask people to do things. Remember all those indirect speech acts, even if we were just asking someone to tell us what time it is. So a big part of politeness is enhancing people's positive face, making them feel good, and respecting people's personal space, giving them the space to make choices. Let's now talk about the language that we can use to do both of those things. So what does it mean to enhance people's positive face? This is all the things we do to make people feel like we like them. All of these are important ways to make social interaction pleasant because you're making other people feel good. So let's talk about some of the strategies that you can use for enhancing other people's face. The first is compliments, and this is probably the most obvious. And we can do this just as part of day-to-day -day interaction to make others feel happy and thereby to make our relationship feel compatible, to feel happy, to feel like the two of us are in a good place. We also sometimes give compliments before we ask for things. So for example, someone says to me, and you have such good editing skills, and I only trust my pros to be presentable because of you. And so I was wondering, which is of course right before they asked me to edit some 30 page document. So that's the first way, giving compliments. The second is asking questions. Asking questions about other people enhances positive face because it shows that you're interested in them. I think people forget that asking questions can work this way. And though as soon as you think about it, you know how good it feels when someone else is asking you questions about something you do or something you care about. You feel like this person is really invested in you and it makes you feel good. Third, within social hierarchies, those in lower positions can enhance the face of those in higher positions by explicitly adhering to linguistic markers of respect, such as titles, or in some languages, more formal pronouns. It is not an oxymoron that distance can make people feel good in some cases. It's a way of showing respect for a particular hierarchy. And then fourth, interestingly, in many Western cultures, if you're in an equally or more powerful position than others, a way to enhance positive face 
can involve making other people feel more like you're equal. So you can, if you're in this higher position, or even an equal one, send signals of camaraderie, like aligning yourself with what someone's saying. You say, I know exactly what you mean. Or you can express equality or closeness by doing using names. Names can do a lot of work here. You say, you know, Anne, I was thinking, and just that Anne can signal that camaraderie. To do this, we can also be sure to reciprocate. So if the person is asking me questions, then I ask questions. That's a way to solidify that kind of equality. So all of those are ways to make people feel good and make them feel like we're being polite by enhancing their positive face. Respecting other people's space is also key to politeness. Given the fact that we often have to impose on others and invade that person's space, we need to respect the space as much as we can. As linguist Robin Lakoff puts it, to be polite, we need to give other people options. So how exactly do you give other people options? Well, here are a few strategies. First, asking indirectly is an important way to respect space. By asking indirectly, we give people more space to say no without directly saying no. Part of this can also be hedging. When we say things like, I was wondering if maybe you might be able to, with all those hedges, like I was wondering if maybe you might, we are helping somebody see that this is a serious request and letting them know we understand if they need to say no. Second, it's also polite to give people outs, to embed the out into the speech act. So you say something like, I know how busy you are, and so I completely understand if you can. So then you've given the person the excuse to say, you know, I really just can't. And the third is apologizing for imposing. And that apology is part of respecting space. It shows your awareness that you are imposing and that you don't take for granted that the other person has to do this for you. So let's now employ all of this knowledge about enhancing positive face and respecting personal space to the tricky situations where we have to say things that may make people uncomfortable in some way. Linguists call these face-threatening acts, or FTAs, and these are the times when we need to be especially linguistically savvy. We'll talk about two general categories of face-threatening acts threats to positive face, and impositions on personal space. So sometimes we have to tell people things we know they won't like. These situations can play out differently depending on the power dynamics involved between these two people. We'll look at the conversational strategies in two different examples. In one, you're in a less powerful position, and in one, you're in a more powerful position. So let's first think about how to navigate a threat to the positive face of a superior. And let's imagine that you need to tell someone above you at work that she's made a mistake. This is clearly face threatening. No one likes to make mistakes and it is very hard, as many of you know, to have them pointed out by anyone, let alone by someone who technically works for you. So it can help to think about ways to enhance the positive face of this person and respect that person's personal space. So how do you do that? Well, first, you can start by saying something positive. For example, that you know how intentional she is and that you know she would want to know if something isn't right. So you've done some important face work there. Then you can give her an out by saying that you saw something that you think may be a mistake. Note the hedge there, may be a mistake. But you may be wrong. You just wanted to point it out to her. But if you wanted to, you could apologize somewhere here. You could say, you're sorry if this isn't how she would want you to handle it, but you're hoping it's okay that you're handling it this way. Now notice here, you're not apologizing for finding a mistake, but you are giving her options for talking about how she would like you to handle this in the future. So you can see how by doing this, by making these different conversation moves, you've positioned this woman who is your superior so that she can accept your pointing out the mistake graciously as part of her doing her job of 
by letting you do the game by jumping. And perhaps also allowing her to take some control of the situation by establishing a protocol. Now, if you're thinking, I'm not sure I could be quite that savvy on the spot, I would say it's not crazy to rehearse something like that. If you know you're going into a loaded situation, think about the wording for what you want to say ahead of time. Now let's think about strategies for when you are the one in a higher ranking position and you're threatening the positive face of a subordinate. Let's imagine that you are giving performance feedback. That could be to an employee, to a student, or to a player on a team you're coaching. Here, let's imagine it's an employee. And if you need to address less than optimal performance, it's worth considering the extent to which you want to simultaneously enhance this person's positive face and or respect the person's speech. What do I mean by try to figure that out? Well, it's going to depend. If this is a performance evaluation of an employee you eventually want to let go, you may not actually want to do that much mitigation. You may not want to do that much enhancing of this person's positive face because you really want them to hear the negatives. But if this is an employee that you want to retain and you want to help improve, it's going to help to allow that employee to see his or her strengths to build on in addition to his or her weaknesses and to give this person options for ways to address the issues. Again, that's part of the space, is here are some options. It's what we think of as constructive criticism. And now I've given you a way to think about constructive criticism in terms of face. What you're doing here is respecting the employee's face. The employee leaves your meeting feeling like they're respected, and I feel like they've been given agency in terms of moving forward from here. Good management takes into account people's face wants and needs. It does not defer to people, but it manages these face needs and wants as part of managing people. Then there are times that we have to impose on others to do things. This is not that hard if we have the institutional power to do so with people, for example, who work for us. But it's harder if they don't. If we're asking for a favor or something beyond someone's duties. Here again, enhancing positive face and respecting a personal space are the keys to making this work well. This is probably something you already do, but what I'm going to do here is show you the strategies you're employing especially for situations that feel more loaded, so you feel like you can use them strategically when you need to. Let's take this scenario. You are asking a friend if you can take her up on last year's offer to use her timeshare in bail. If you were going to do this, you might start with a compliment. This is often how we start. You might say something like, you were so generous to offer the timeshare last year, and it looks gorgeous. I think that this year it would be a possibility. And then, as you go on with this request, you might offer her some space and some options. You might say something like, I completely understand if you're using it or somebody else has already asked. But I was wondering, and note there that I was wondering the indirect speech act to make the actual request. And I have to say, it's amazing how well this works. Just the other week, someone called me and they needed to ask me to do something at work. And they started with, we're so glad you're doing this job because we think you're just the person who can help us with this. And I realized that at that point, I really wanted to help them because they believed that I could help them. So it does work. The obvious th face-threatening acts that impose on others include things like requests, commands, and threats. What many people don't realize is that giving advice is also a face-threatening act. When you give advice, you are imposing on someone's plan by offering guidance or offering a suggestion. Advice can go wrong when people forget that it can be an imposition, and they just offer it as if it is always and only a gift. That when I give you advice, I'm just giving you a gift. Advice also needs to get mitigated sometimes. 
things. For example, enhancing someone's positive face before offering the advice or giving the person space to reject the advice. I think we've all been in the situation where you give advice and somebody gets annoyed. And this may be more about how you offer the advice rather than the content of the advice itself. If you think about advice giving as a potentially face-threatening act, you will be able to frame it more effectively. Let's now turn to what to do when a situation has gone awry, no matter how well planned your conversational choices, and you need to make amends. You need to apologize. Interestingly, this is actually a speech act that is face-threatening to the speaker. In apologizing, what we're doing is admitting to doing something wrong or doing something that requires amends, and we're asking for forgiveness. This is a very vulnerable position, and we all know that there are lots of ways to apologize badly or unsuccessfully. We've done this, and we've had it done to us. We sometimes say to people, that was no apology, or he didn't really apologize. At first blush, we might want to say that we are unsatisfied with the apology because the apology isn't true. But linguists argue that speech acts like apologies or promises aren't about being true or not true. They aren't statements with facts that are true or not true. Apologies and promises are about being successful or unsuccessful. So linguists talk about the conditions for success of this kind of speech act. And the conditions include these three things. First of all, authority. Does the speaker have the authority and the ability to make a promise or an apology? The second is context. Is this a context where it makes sense for the speaker to make this promise or apology? And the third is recognizability. Is the wording such that other people would see this as a promise or an apology? So let's think about what makes an apology successful. First, I need to be the person with the authority to apologize for whatever it was. We all know that me apologizing for someone else is not the same as that person apologizing. Second, the context needs to be right. The most successful context for apologies is directly to the injured party or parties, be that in person, by phone, or by letter or email. And there's probably a hierarchy of success there. A lot of people prefer apologies in person. And then third, my apology has to be recognized by the injured party or parties as an apology. This last component gets us into some interesting territory because a successful apology needs to sound like we mean it, which often means moving beyond, but not away from, just the conventions of apology, words like, I'm sorry, or moving beyond cliche like, I didn't mean it. These can seem too easy and not genuine. We as speakers can learn from some very public apologies that have gone wrong and gone right. Let's start with an apology gone wrong. President Clinton's multiple attempts at apologizing for the Monica Lewinsky incident are a very good example. Robin Lakoff has analyzed the ways that this apology went awry. Probably most important, President Clinton used a lot of wording that expressed regret, but did not do the speech act of apologizing. He said things such as, it was wrong and inappropriate, and he said things like, I have admitted that I made a mistake. But saying I've admitted I made a mistake is not the same thing as saying I'm sorry. He also said some of these things to the wrong people. For example, he said some of them on a trip to Europe. We can contrast this with a very successful public, public apology in June of 2012 by Jason Alexander, the comedian perhaps most famous for being George, on the television program Seinfeld. Alexander had made a series of jokes about cricket on the Craig Ferguson show, poking fun at the sport for, quote unquote, being gay. He was called out for this by some Twitter followers who said the jokes were offensive. 
Alexander sent out a lengthy apology on Twitter that made headlines for being such a successful apology. People have a sense that this was heartfelt, not perfunctory. So why? What can we learn from this? Let's start with the fact that the apology was over a thousand words long, even on Twitter. And the apology seems very candid about where the material came from, about Alexander's genuine confusion upon hearing that it had offended others. He's talking it through with some gay friends to try and understand his realization about the really serious implications in terms of his jokes building on stereotypes and assumptions that can lead to the bullying and discrimination against gay people. He then writes such self-critical things as, and here I'm quoting, and the worst part is I should know better. My daily life is filled with gay men and women, both socially and professionally. I'm profoundly aware of the challenges these friends of mine face, and I've openly advocated on their behalf. Now consider the face work Alexander's doing there. He's criticizing himself, but also trying to highlight for others the work that he has done. Alexander then makes sure to do the actual speech act of apologizing. So he writes, so I can only apologize, and I do. He does not say, I apologize if people were offended. That is very different. You're not saying you're sorry you did it. You're saying you're sorry when people were offended that you did it. He says, I'm sorry. There are important lessons here for all of us. One is the importance of the actual words, I'm sorry, or I apologize. But then there's the fact that these words alone are often not enough for us to be believable or for our apology to be accepted. And then there's the speech act involved in accepting an apology. This is often most effective when it's most direct. Something like, I accept your apology, or I forgive you. It is a powerful, powerful move as a speaker not to accept an apology. The other speaker has threatened their own face and by not accepting the apology, we do nothing to help them repair their face. I want to end this lecture by talking a bit more about compliments, as the politics of compliments are trickier than many people realize. I'll hear people say sometimes, but it was a compliment, really mystified as to why someone did not take it that way. So what's happening here? We've talked about compliments as a way to enhance positive face by making others feel good and liked. And this is certainly true. But compliments can also be face-threatening. You're thinking, really? But they can be. First of all, compliments can create an imbalance. For example, a casual acquaintance compliments me, and I'm thinking, how do I respond so that I can maintain the equality here, so that I don't seem arrogant for having taken a compliment and given nothing back? And then, if someone's complimenting my stuff, are they coveting it? And is it okay to compliment your boss on, say, a tire? Or is that belittling? In other words, when are compliments polite and when are they face threatening? To some extent, this is culturally variable, and you need to figure out what is complimentary and how to respond in the culture you're in. Let's start with the etiquette of responding to compliments. In many cultures in the U.S., it's expected that you will respond to a compliment. One option is to accept it with, for example, a thank you. And often people will add a little O. Oh, thank you, to indicate surprise that we weren't just expecting the compliment. And then often people will add some self-deprecation to minimize that power imbalance created by the compliment. And that gets us to another option, which is deflecting the compliment. There are at least two ways to do this. One is minimizing the thing being complimented. Oh, it took no effort. Or, this thing, I got it on sale. People will also do some self-criticism. They get a compliment on their presentation and they say, oh no, parts of that presentation were really incoherent. The politics of compliments can also depend in part on the gender of the speakers. Studies show that compliments occur most among equals because that reduces the face threat. And then women tend to give and get significantly more compliments than men. This is coming from a study by Janet Holmes in New Zealand. She also found that men 
give more compliments to women than to other men. And there's socialization there about who gives and who gets compliments. Perhaps unsurprisingly, women tend to get more compliments on appearance. And this leads us to a second important point. The politics of a compliment, how it's going to be read, will also depend on who's complimenting who and in what context. In the workplace, compliments about attire or appearance will often feel loaded for the person receiving the compliment, even if the compliment is sincere. Depending on the two people involved, this kind of compliment potentially sexualizes the relationship. It may suggest that the person's clothing are somehow relevant and available for comment in the workplace. It can also feel like a power play. If the person giving the compliment is a subordinate, it can suggest a kind of equality because compliments often happen among equals. If the compliment is by someone who is the boss, it can feel like an imposition of that power to say, I can compliment you on this. So this is something to keep in mind that in this context, while a speech act may look like a compliment, it also carries messages about what is being noticed and what is available for comment. And then there's the issue of the stranger compliment. When someone you do not know compliments you on something. Now again, it's going to depend on context and on what this person's complimenting. Many women will say that they do not take it as a compliment. When men they do not know yell compliments, for example, out a car window about their bodies. But many women may take it as a compliment if someone, male or female, stops them to admire, for example, a handbag or a piece of jewelry. And in fact, that kind of compliment can function as a conversation starter of, you know, I couldn't help but notice. Or it can happen, for example, after a talk, someone comes up and says, that was a terrific talk. And then you're off and rolling on a conversation. Now, one quick interesting note here on the language of compliments, because now this is something you can go out and notice. A study shows that women tend to use more of the wording, what a, what a great car. And men will tend to just say, great car. So now you can go out and watch for that. If you're now saying, but how am I to know when a compliment won't be read as a compliment? My response is, you can't always know. But you can learn to read the subtleties of any situation. And if you're in doubt, you can set up a compliment saying it's a compliment. You can say something like, I hope this will sound like a compliment because it is. But even if you do that, that is no guarantee that it will always be read as a compliment. So in this lecture, we've talked about ways to navigate those tricky situations where you have to tell people hard things or impose on them in some way. And I've emphasized the importance of enhancing positive face and respecting personal space. These two concepts will remain highly relevant as we talk about the way conversations work in professional relationships in the next lecture. Watch your clock.